day. And in order for us to get to excellence, that means that we have to do some tweaking. That means that we have to make some changes, and that means that we really have to do that with our eyes on children, all children. That on this edition of Let's Talk Sensi, a one-on-one -on -one with Cincinnati School District Superintendent Arenetta Wright. That we have to be children focused, children centered, not just in what we say, but in what we do every day. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. Hello everyone, I'm Curtis Fuller and welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. You know, Cincinnati is one of the largest school districts in the state of Ohio with roughly 36,000 students. And at the helm is Superintendent Ironetta Wright. She is a Jacksonville, Florida native. She held many positions during her 25 plus years in the Duval County, Florida School District and then served as Deputy Superintendent for Detroit Public Schools before taking on her role right here in Cincinnati in May of 2022 and so welcome superintendent Wright. it's thank good you. to see you thank you nice to see you one year already huh? one year <laughs> already what did you learn about you in this first year of being the superintendent i learned uh, my ability to transition into a community uh, to become a part of that community my ability to listen uh, to learn to take feedback um, to pivot where necessary, and to remain resilient. Goals, obviously you set goals. I remember talking about those. Uh, explain what some of the goals were and those goals that were met. You know, during our first 100 days, we really did a listening and learning session, listening and learning tours, where we were all over the community. Uh, community members were coming in and talking about what's going well, what's not going well, and what should we do differently. And so from that was born um, back to the basics, and nothing is more basic than the ABCs. We found, as still is the case, that Cincinnati Public Schools has done a lot, uh, has done some amazing work, has partnered with the community, uh, has really made sure that they are operating opportunities for students all across the district, but we've done a lot. And so this was an opportunity for us to go slow, to go fast. And from that was born our ABCs, academics, behavior, and culture. So throughout this year, that's really been our focus. In talking to, to people in the community, uh, did you get the sense that there was this full support for CPS among parents and other community leaders? Absolutely. You know, this is my third urban school district, um, having been in Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County, as well as Detroit Public Schools Community District. Two very large. Two very yeah. large school districts. And coming to Cincinnati, I think that there is just such a value in the compactness of Cincinnati, number one. But number two, I learned as I came to the district, even before actually coming as superintendent, that there was such pride in the community. You know, I lived in Jacksonville my entire life until I went to, to Detroit about six years ago now. I don't know how many neighborhoods there are in Jacksonville. I have no idea how many there are in Detroit, but I know that there are 52 neighborhoods in Cincinnati. And what I've come to learn from that is there is such pride within those neighborhoods for what's happening in schools, for how partners and community partners and neighbors are supporting schools. And really the neighborhoods that really have schools in their neighborhood, they see them as their neighborhood schools. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I know parents get a bad rap many times of, you know, more parental involvement, but I get the sense that parents are as involved as they can possibly be. You know, most parents want to be involved. They want to give back to the schools. Um, did, did you get that sense as well? I, I, I agree with you. And having worked at, in every role in a school district, starting as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, so forth and so on, you know, I recognize that we have a diverse population of parents. We have parents that are able to go into schools daily and volunteer. They're there at pickup. They're there in the afternoon when students are going home. And so they're, they're a staple at the school. We have other parents that, that, are, that are working. You know, they're working in a nine to five job and they may not be able to come in during the day, but they don't miss a performance in the afternoon or they make sure that their children are doing their homework when necessary or they're there and available for parent teacher conferences. We have other parents that are working two and three jobs trying to make ends meet. And so it's really important that we celebrate all parents and recognize that all parents want what's best for their children. That's a part of our Be Present initiative. Be Present really was a call to action for the community, but also a resolve to remind parents that we see you, we value you, we want you involved, we want your feet 
feedback, but we also know that parenting and caregiving for our children looks different for different people. We have about a minute left in this sec uh, segment, um, but I want to ask you about the new start times. Uh, and if we have to take a break, we'll finish it on the other side. But that'll be a huge change come August for, for many parents and many students. It will be. When I think about my transition to the district, um, you know, safety and security is also is always first. It's the first thing that you think about. And with some of the challenges that we've had in our community, uh, safety and security for our schools has really kept me up at night. Um, the second thing that's kept me up at night, starting from the week before school started, I actually, was transportation. And recognizing that transportation was a challenge. Uh, we want to make sure that our children are in school every day and they're there on time. But but it's so hard to hold students and families accountable for that when we can't get our buses to school on time because we're a part of a national driver shortage. We don't have enough buses to actually get our students for the routes that they need to get them to school. So it's been an ongoing struggle the entire year. And so we set out at the beginning of the year to make sure that we address, not just address, but fix the problem, working in partnership with the board, working in partnership with an outside organization that could give us some expert advice, really looking at the quality uh, uh, advice that we have from those that are already in the, in the department that have been doing this for a long time, we realized that our best opportunity to get our students to school on time and maximize transportation for them was a change in start times. We had about six or seven different start times across our district, and that does not include the start times of all the non-public and charter schools that we are responsible for providing transportation for as well. Mm -hmm. So it allowed us to, to really prepare to move forward. You, you, you mentioned uh, some of the challenges, especially with safety, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, after this break. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. I'm Curtis Fuller here with the Superintendent of Cincinnati Public Schools, Ironetta Wright. Uh, you talked about those things that keep you up yeah. <laughs> late at night and and obviously and we talked about this when you first came because there, there were issues nationally occurring in terms of school safety. But we when it gets close to home, like we saw um, here this past year, uh, it, it must be troubling. But the resolve is to try to find a fix to, to make the school safer. Absolutely. I think that one of the things that we talk about often is school safety is not just a school district responsibility, um, but it is a community responsibility as well. Um, we know in the community the challenges that we've had specifically around one of our high schools where we had students that were shot at a bus stop that wasn't far from the school. Um, we had students that had a situation off campus where they came back to campus. And all of those issues are very traumatic. Um, but what we know is that students find solace at the school. So if there is a problem, if there is an issue, if there is a concern, they're going to come to the school. Even when they're hurting, they know that they can come to the school and the staff at the school is going to help them. But it's scary. It's scary to know that you have children at a public bus stop and there is a drive-by at the bus stop. Um, so it's important that we collectively have conversation around what we can do as a community. Of course, at our school buildings, we want to make sure that our students understand the importance of sharing information. If you see something, say something. We want parents to be involved and engaged in what's happening with their children. What's in the backpacks? You know, checking those backpacks before they come to school. Social media is causing a challenge for us. Um, and you know, it doesn't have to be used that way. I'm a person that's on social media. It doesn't have to be used that way, but oftentimes issues start on social media before we can ever get involved at the school. And already and there is a problem. Neighborhood, neighborhood issues rips, that, yeah. that come. Yeah. And so while it doesn't become an issue that starts at the school, it becomes the school's problem because it's brought to the school. So we've really had some positive conversations with our mayor, our city manager, our police chief, to really talk about community partners, to really talk about as an overall community of Cincinnati, what can we do to ensure this is what we're doing for safety inside the school, but this is what everybody can do to be present when it comes to being safe. 
I would imagine uh, in terms of challenges, one of the biggest challenges, uh, as you, and, and you knew you would deal with this in terms of uh, working with teachers, working with uh, uh, outside uh, community leaders. The principals union was critical of you a couple of months ago. Um, you, you responded to that. Talk about where you are with that because um, um, the union alleged that people were leaving the district because they didn't get along with you. Mm -hmm. so, so address that. You know, change is always hard, and I recognize change is hard. When I think about Cincinnati Public Schools as a system and as a district, I am the fourth superintendent since 2017. That is a lot of change in a short amount of time for individuals. I realize that I have drive and I have passion, and I have a sense of urgency when it comes to outcomes for children. That passion and drive sometimes comes across as something different, and it's really only about the fact that children can't wait. You know, when we think about the, the impacts of the pandemic on our kids, we have a lot of children that are excelling, but we have a lot of students that are struggling. And so how can we move with a sense of urgency that ensures what students need, they're getting every day? I also believe, however, that all, all feedback is good feedback because, you know, uh, as, as someone shared with me, I run really, really, really fast. And sometimes <laughs> I'm at mile 75 and others are still getting on the highway. Right. So it's important for me to take that feedback. Uh, I had conversation with our team, conversation with our unions, conversation with our principals around what we can do to ensure that they're getting the support that they need. Not that we're going any slower, but that we're bringing everyone along with us and and that we're having the dialogue that's important to understand the whys. And, and I think that that's feedback for me. It allowed me to pivot and to reset, but it doesn't change the passion. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take another break, and then we're going to talk about uh, a partnership to get more black men back in the classroom. It's, it's interesting what's happening, not just here, but nationwide. Back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. According to the National Education Association, only 7% of teachers across the nation are black, and only 2% are black men. A local group is encouraging young men of color to get into the classroom through a partnership with Cincinnati Public Schools. The Leading Men Fellowship wants to bridge the race and gender gap in education. Take a look. It's just the importance of having African-American males in our schools and just the presence of males in general so that our, our young males are able to see themselves, to have role models in the classroom. The goal is to truly create a pipeline um, of just available talent to enter in the education, stay there, but also to further their own education so they can get associate's degrees, bachelor's. You better. Let's try it again. You guys ready? I wish I would have had someone like a younger black male that I could have looked up to at that age to just ask for advice or just look at me like, oh, well, I can do that too. Like, it'd just be something great to have. So I serve as the program manager for Leading Men Fellowship, which is a program of the Literacy Lab. So Cincinnati um, is part of a three-city expansion. So came to Cincinnati, Atlanta, and then the Phoenix area. Uh, we got here through a Greenlight Fund as well as a lot of partnership that came through uh, Cincinnati Preschool Promise. Cincinnati Public Schools was at the table from the very beginning. I'm a literacy tutor at Rising Stars Chevy at Westwood Preschool and I help kids learn how to identify letters and numbers and build their oral vocabulary. There's definitely more letters. Curve forward. Play games with them, sing songs. And we, uh, I write their name every day, help them write their name. What kind of ball is this? A basket. Yellow. So I previously taught at two camps in Bond Hill working with children. So I felt like this would be a good opportunity to get back into it because I did enjoy the time previously when I was teaching them. So. Uh, we started this year again with the 20 fellows and we look to be expanding uh, over the next several years.
What I always say is that you have the opportunity for oversized impact in your classroom, right? Specifically, as we're talking about early childhood education, uh, it's 98% women. So getting them on the ground floor becomes just this great and incredible opportunity. Other litter mates. That's why. Good job. Some children don't have a role model in their life, and we're that for them. So we're definitely a good positive influence on their life. I think the number one goal for us, yes, we want to see the impact in the classroom. Yes, we want to build this pipeline. Uh, but my number one goal and what I've always stated is that I want to build strong men. I want them to be better for having come through the program, um, not only just connected through to, you know, myself or resources, uh, but I want them to kind of look at this as a brotherhood. From the students to the connections I have outside of the school, also my fellows that I work with. Whenever I come here, this put me in a great mood. I love their energy. It's just through the roof. Like There's no other words to describe it. <laughs> and there is no other word to describe <laughs> when you're working with young people. That's right. Uh, you talk about that all the time. This, this is just good because you have people coming in from the community wanting to help. Obviously, it has to be structured, but just the desire to help is, is, seems to me to be a positive thing. And it's really important to get young black men into schools around young children. Um, you know, as was shared in the presentation, a lot of our children don't see that all the time. They don't necessarily see themselves in school buildings. And so to bring these young men in and to partner them in pre-K classrooms, uh, so they're working with students on some of those foundational skills that they need is really important. Uh, we are also hoping that we're able to use a of the, the Leading Men's Fellows as a pipeline to increase the number of African-American males that we have in the teaching profession in the district as a whole. Uh, we have launched our Black Male Initiatives, which is really around re increasing the number of men that we have in education, specifically black ma males, and retaining them once they're there. And so this becomes, you know, every everywhere is a pipeline, but this becomes a real um, specific pipeline that's already in the district. Many of the students are, many of the young men, uh, everyone in the school seems like a student to me, but many of the young men, they're, they're graduates, and so they're high school graduates. Uh, some of them are working on their associate's degrees or they're working on their bachelor's degrees. So we want to keep them encouraged and we want to, to see them come back uh, to CPS and really come back as a teacher. You and I had a chance uh, just recently uh, to be a part of um, the Educator of the Year program put on by Western Southern. They've been doing this for uh, 17 years now, named after Lawrence Hawkins, a great educator and uh, community leader, Tuskegee Airmen, by the way. 70, no, about 80 people were nominated, and then it was whittled down to 15 semifinalists, five semifinalists, and then the one winner, if you will, yeah. wins $10,000. $10, yes. At some point, we have to televise that because the stories that you hear about these educators and what people think of them is just very impressive. And you've been a part of it now for two years. Absolutely. So, you know, last year, going to the Educator of the Year Awards was my first event that I went to as superintendent. It was my third day on the job. And <laughs> as soon as I was named as superintendent, they reached out to me and asked if I would attend the event. And of course, graciously, I said yes. But being a lifelong educator, I sat in the, in the hall where the event was. You know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful event that was sponsored by Western and Southern. And I sat there and I envisioned having a full facility where we were honoring a teacher at every single school. And that had not been done before. And so we shared that with Mr. Barrett uh, from Western and Southern. He said, we love the idea, let's go for it. Our team worked really closely over the course of the year um, with the Western and Southern team. And from that, each of our schools had, had a, an educator of the year that's recognized at their school building. And then from that, it went through a review process for the top 15. And then from the top 15 to the top five, 
five. One of the most exciting things for me this year uh, was being able to go and surprise the top five all in one day. Had to do it at one time uh, to, to surprise the top five in their classrooms. And you, as you know, I spend a lot of time in schools and a lot of time in classrooms. So I noticed as I went in, you know, they didn't stop teaching. They nodded or they waved or, you know, they did whatever they do when I come in the classroom. But when they realized these other people were with me, they stopped. And so they, I took over the class and started by talking to the students and really sharing with the students what it meant uh, for their teacher to be recognized as one of the top five finalists uh, in, the, in the entire school district. And the way the students applauded or they ran up to their teachers and gave them hugs. And this was from the youngest student mm -hmm. to our high school students as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the embraces from the teachers, just the recognition. It was just really powerful. And it's really been a highlight of the school year. And we should point out, Dr. Mary Webb from Withrow yes. is the educator of the year. Yes, she is. Yeah, we'll be back in a moment. While the time does go by fast, you really do have the most important job around. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, overseeing all these kids. Priorities, if you had the top three going forward, where do we go from here? You know, our board has been really aggressive in our goals and guardrails, and we have board approved goals, uh, which are our expectations for where we go next, and we have guardrails, which are our values that resonate within the community, the things that are really important to us as a Cincinnati public schools community. I think the first is really looking at academic improvement, academic achievement across the board, making certain that we're seeing an improvement in our scores for students, because we want to make sure that we, that we share that scores are not just scores, they represent students, right? Those, those numbers have eyes attached to them and we want to make sure that we're seeing improvement because when the scores increase, that means outcomes are changing for children. And, and 30 seconds left, uh, uh, two, two more quick, less than 30, I'm told. Making certain that we are also looking at our racial disparities mm -hmm. and so that we're focused on our equity and closing the achievement gaps that exist between our students. All right, thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the time we have for now. We'll see you next week for another edition of Let's Talk Sensitive.